All right, greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal Hill, Adams Van Sale, and tonight we're not going to sp be specifically shining a light on the goings on down right. south, but I think uh, tonight the, the topic that I'm going to discuss with my guest is going to be a topic that's going to be applicable not just to the Western world, but also to some of the cultural warring that's going on here at the southern tip of Africa. So uh, maybe just a quick introduction, though I do think a lot of my audience members already recognize my guest tonight. My guest tonight is Alex Kashuta. She is tuning in and going to be taking part in the conversation all the way from Romania. Uh, and she's going, she is a writer, a podcaster, a commentator. And uh, some of the topics that she covers on her podcast are politics, culture, history, ideology, and a lot of uh, subversive ideas, and I think that lends to the the title of her podcast. So welcome on the show, Alex. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on. All right. So maybe let's start off with a, a solid foundation, and that is your own personal story. Uh, I think I, I'm <laughs> definitely not the first person that has asked this question, but it's always so fascinating when I talk to a, a guest for the first time, someone that has an, an interesting perspective. You always learn that they've never had that perspective. they forever they weren't born with it it's not something that they've they did they weren't based at 10 or based at 18 uh, it's <laughs> almost like a, a something that's a, a slow a slow boil and comes to a, a very interesting conclusion in the end and it doesn't even mean that either you or me have reached the end like we've reached the the truth now and now we're just going to be uh, in this uh, state of mind or worldview forever. But that's why it's always so interesting to me to talk to people about their own personal journey because it, it has a little bit of always a little element that other people can relate to as well. So uh, go ahead. I think uh, the floor is all yours. Yes, it's uh, it's been it's been a journey. <laughs> it definitely has. <laughs> I, I did not expect to, to find myself here in the in the middle of the dissident right or whatever we're calling <laughs> the movement. Um, it's very heterogeneous. So, you know, we're probably going to go into this. There's all sorts of uh, strains to this movement. But, uh, you know, it, it is kind of uh, a new thing um, and it's an exciting thing. And that's kind of that's what my podcast covers. I'm kind of trying to be almost like a scene report of what what's happening in the sphere and, you know, the people that are interested. But um, as I said, I didn't come from the right. Uh, I didn't really have much of a of a political upbringing. My parents, you know, they were very, they were they were liberal in the sense of they wanted to, um, you know, access the Western market and not be under communism. You know, that was a, the main thing. Uh, they wanted a hundred types of chocolate. They thought that was really good. Um, they wanted a bright future for their children, as as do uh, as does everyone. Um, and then my upbringing was obviously I had kind of an instinctive uh, I was drawn instinctively to socialism as one is if if you go outside your door and see a homeless person and you're mm. I don't know 13 years old and you think why are there rich people why are there poor people I to be honest I was all mm. I, I thought back okay what was my my what what drew me to socialism it was just that contrast you know being being thrust into the um the, the the darkness of life and i think uh socialism for a lot of people is just kind of coping with that because it's a very simple solution it's like okay take from the rich give to the poor bada bing bada boom we solve the problem you know let's let's do it let's do it guys <laughs> especially with the, right. the energy of youth it sounds awesome um that was very short-lived because you know <laughs> then i started to do the math and yeah okay that didn't <laughs> doesn't work out exactly the the way mm. the, that people think um, but then uh, when I was in, um, in college, I was drawn to kind of feminist studies. I mean, I, I studied economics, but there was um, uh, my major is in diversity management, <laughs> which mm. everyone can kind of, it's, it's essentially feminism in a business suit. Very much, mm. uh, yeah. You yeah, were well on your way to an HR position with that, uh, with oh, that yeah. on that path. <laughs> a well-paid HR position, <laughs> right. um, and uh, yeah, I think I grew out of that quite quite quickly after after college. It took me about one or two years to do the math again uh, with that, and uh, <laughs> it also didn't work out. So um, essentially, I've kind of gone through these. Um, I've, I've always been a very curious person, and mm. at the beginning of my life, I kind of went for these extinct instinctive positions that you know every young person has. And then you slowly start, like I said, doing the math on them uh, and they just don't pan out that well. And, you know, continuously doing the math and extrapolating and thinking my way through all of these ideological positions, I've ended up in 
this, you know, in the seventh circle of hell with, with all the frogs. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I've extrapolated too much. <laughs> but here well, I am. Well, it's uh, either a circle of hell or it's one of the ten plagues. So, uh, I mean, you pick your poison yeah. when it comes to your oh, symbolism. Boy. But yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I think that's why that's why I said earlier th that type of question. It might be a cliche when it comes to uh, our circles. People always ask like, "What's your journey?" Almost like you quit a drug or you got off some uh, uh, some hard heroin or something. But maybe some of the ideologies that some of us used to adhere to are like drugs. They are some type of opiate uh, in ideological form. I mean, it was uh, Carl Jung that said um, ide all types of addiction uh, are bad and dangerous, whether it be alcohol or heroin or idealism. And I think that's definitely something that a lot of our people, specifically in my generation, are afflicted with, uh, is uh, just an overdose of idealism and thinking that, well, uh, we're different. Uh, we're going to do things right. Uh, we don't have to listen to our, our parents that don't know what's going on, that have no idea. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's something that I've realized. And I think this adds uh, to the, the the topic that I wanted to discuss tonight, the broader topic. And that's that a lot of people in our circles have gone through a, a journey. I remember when uh, Carl Rittenhouse went, uh, I did, he did his first interview. I can't remember with who. I almost want to say Tucker Carlson, but I, I can't remember. And he said he actually supports Black Lives Matter. And there was many people on the right that looked at him and, and kind of condemned him and mocked him. And uh, my response was just, Do you, are you pretending like, like that at 18 years old, you were just ridiculously based and clued in? And you weren't just a kid. You weren't just a teenager. I mean, dude, if if you asked 18-year-old me to define Marxism, I would ask you first, what is Marxism before you even <laughs> ask me how to define it? So it's, it's really a, a case of people go through these types of journeys. People, your ideas develop. And uh, it's interesting, the point where I personally find myself in, and you seem to be enjoying the the point where you find yourself in in regards to ideas as well, even though this isn't the end, it's just a, a, a halfway stop or maybe one of the checkpoints in the longer journey. Yeah, it's, it definitely isn't the end. I mean, essentially, the, the, the purpose of my podcast uh, has been to clarify these questions for myself, to mm. talk to the people that I found extremely interesting, um, which seem to be a lot of, you know, weird anonymous accounts, you know, very insightful people. Um, mm. And uh, to to see, okay, um, essentially, what, what uh, moved it for me was, like you said at the beginning of, of our conversation, the fact that I was disillusioned with a lot of the promises mm. uh, of, uh, you know, liberal politics. Because essentially, uh, if you come from like the direction of, of rationalism, which I come from, that was kind of the next step for me after my, uh, my, um, I don't know, a feminist college experience. I, I went to rationalism uh, and then a bit of like a Reddit atheism. You know, I had like a debunking column and then the Romanian version of Vice, just like total cringe. You know, if anyone's going to look that up, if you want to look it up, it's it's really cringe. I, I, I assume responsibility for the cringe. Well, it was uh, it was Roger Scruton that said uh, we our age needs a lot, lot less debunking and a lot more bunking. <laughs> oh, exactly. Well, now I'm bunking hard. <laughs> so um, it's, uh, yeah. So what I want to say is that, you know, I, you kind of moved through the IDW. The IDW was really big. Like you said, in 2016, there was a different energy mm -hmm. and everyone was like, okay, we need to return to classical liberal principles. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what's going to save us. Um, and I was, you know, kind of, you know, marinating in that soup, thinking about classical liberal principles. And I was, you know, also co contrasting that idea with what's happening in the real world. Um, and then I slowly understood um, a bit more about how power works. You know, power is not not a, a variable in the theory of classical liberalism, at least how it's presented by you know people in the in the IDW. Um, they don't speak about it. It's always about ideas, the marketplace of ideas. People discuss stuff, and the best idea, the truth, somehow through some some you know crystallizes out and wins in the end in this marketplace of ideas. What I saw in the real world was that truth did not win crazy aberrations, abominations won. Things that, you know, essentially just strong arm their way through the marketplace of ideas with nothing to back mm. them except for a backing from power, um, you know, became official truth uh, without mm. any sort of um, necessary legitimation from this marketplace of ideas. So, um, you know, when you see this once, you know, you, you think it might be an aberration. When you observe reality for a long time, you see that this is a norm. And people in that mm. sphere did not have any answer for why this was a norm. It was just like, oh, you, we just need to podcast harder. We need <laughs> right. to just <laughs> we need to write more uh, op-eds 
is to convince people of the truth, to see the facts. Uh, and then the fact checkers would one come in. Po uh, one podcast, the one opinion piece can save the world. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I think this is also kind of the hubris of the um, kind of the, the he heterodox intellectual thinking that, you know, by setting up Substack, you can, you know, I, I probably have some of this as well. I, I like the fact that, you know, I, I might convince some someone important who has a bit of a lever of power to change their mind might happen. But the idea that um, through through the power of magical power of podcasting, we're just going to change mm. the course of humanity. I've kind of been um, talked out of that a long time ago. Um, mm. Part of this was also, um, you know, uh, getting in touch with the works of people like Nick Land and Curtis Yarvin and, and you know, dark intellectuals like that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when you read that stuff, it's like you, you kind of are like mm. you kind of cringe at yourself. You cringe at it first and then you cringe at yourself and then you're like, oh, God. <laughs> what's going on here <laughs> right yeah and i i remember around 2016 the 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 very big buzzword or not buzzword but the big money term was the battle of ideas that was the big thing we are all taking part in the battle of ideas but how the battle of ideas was being conceptualized at the time was that it's this gladiatorial combat. Like in this corner, we have flat earth. And in this corner, we have whatever. And tonight, there's like blood sports between these two. In tonight's fight, we have Marxist bio-Leninism versus monarchism, whatever. And that was pretty much what the battle of ideas was understood as by many people online. It was more of like a spectacle than anything else. But at, at the same time, they get this, uh, well, the, they, I mean, I was part of that whole, uh, that whole not movement, but that environment, you get that sense of this isn't just entertainment. This is also having a big impact. We're changing the world of ideas. And there's been a massive disillusionment. And that's actually what I wanted to get to as well. Um, I think we can very much, with very much certainty say we're living smack dab in the post Trump world. I don't think we're living in the I, I like to think of uh, of history in, in different paradigms, but it comes, uh, every country has their different paradigms, but it feels to me like we've exited the Trump paradigm and entered something new. I mean, without even, let's not even consider COVID coming onto the scene. Even without COVID, we would have been in a different time right now when it comes to this type of uh, a shift on the right. Because there is a lot of... Uh, a lot of demoralization that's going on when it comes to yeah we had this big crescendo of populism and hope in in twin around 2016 not just centered around trump around different types of movements like for example brexit uh many uh more conservative leaders being elected into power or gaining momentum they would really felt like the the momentum of history was on the right side and the the, pe the pendulum was the other favorite metaphor the pendulum's going to swing back but in the end, now we find ourselves in 2020 and the, the, the right is kind of in disarray. We're not in a, in a position of ascendancy. We're kind of in a position of survival. So when it comes to this post-Trump world, it's, it's very interesting to see the different types of ideas that now start to surface. And I think your podcast is a good case study in regards to some of these new ideas, maybe not in the bigger picture new, but on the, on the political scene, new ideas that are coming to the fore. Um, how have you experienced uh, this shift going on? I mean, you've touched on it so far in one of your um, answers so far, but how have you experienced the shift in the, po like I said, in the post-Trump world? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people have felt that disillusionment that you describe. Um, it's, it's a bit of a of a return to basics, which I found quite um, quite good and quite interesting because it you know it kind of let a thousand flowers bloom bloom on the right. There's so many people thinking about these things from from first principles. So not only pre enlightenment, but you know people going back to the classics, you know studying uh, ancient literature, studying politics the way it was viewed by by the Romans, by you know emperors and then you know cicero everyone is is trying to kind of cover their own turf and understand mm -hmm. um because i think the, the the big shift the big the big mind melt that people had was to realize that liberalism is the water we swim in and when you have that shift when when you're kind of look at it from you know you look at yourself from from outside of your body you know that kind of transcendental view of oh my god you know this this is the paradigm we're in. I'm I'm obviously a liberal because I live in it. It's in, invisible to me, 
But this is a very hegemonic, very powerful movement. Very, it, it engulfs everything, and it's extremely imperialistic as well. So it, it cannot um, sustain yeah. a competition. Um, and you don't see this until you see it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. Um, <laughs> and I think a lot of people had that experience. Yeah. And that's why they go back to, you know, to Machiavelli. They go back to, I don't know, Mosca, Perito, um, all, all of these Edmund people. Burke. Exactly. Edmund Burke, uh, yeah. John Stuart Mill, uh, Rousseau, all, every sort of political theorist is, is dragged back into the, into the spotlight and people right. are starting to, to take uh, lessons from it. Um, and I think the, the new shift, um, and actually I, I watched a, a stream recently, I don't know if it was a stream or a video, um, it was uh, you know, from a slightly spicy poster, but I think he's a very intelligent guy. It was um, mm. Edwards and, uh, no, Keith Woods, <laughs> not Edwards, <laughs> Keith Woods and uh, Joel Davis were talking about um, kind of the, the, the nationalism versus liberalism. I think that's a really mm. good uh, stream to watch. Um, but I think it's, it's also a good summation of, of the conclusions that a lot of people have come to um, because you know, it's a lot of people look at what's going on from a very philosophical perspective. They uh, think that, okay, we just need to, you know, sit on your couch at home and devise the, the new, the plan for the new regime. And that's not how things work. Um, there's a lot of structural things. Um, and in a way, liberalism is essentially the political, um, uh, the flowering of politics around the, the structure of kind of techno capital and the fact that, you know, you have the industrial revolution, you have, you know, wide ranging communications technology that's constantly centralizing, you know, this is essentially the political system that fits with that structural situation. Right. Whatever thing is going to come after that will have to um, integrate into that structure or, or uh, take it over, you know, with a new narrative, but it will have to accept mm. that that's, you know, that's a playing field. So there's a lot of people talking about monarchy. They're talking about, um, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, very old types of or organizing society, which worked in feudal systems, which worked in, in other, you know, types of yeah, societies, <laughs> but mm. they, they're not necessarily adapted to, to what's going on right now. So whatever is going to come, will have to, you know, mm. assess the playing field and adapt itself as a mimetic virus is going to <laughs> supersede what's going on right now. Right. Uh, well, maybe just a small note there. Um, I do find the conversation surrounding monarchy and monarchism very interesting, but you're not going to, you are going to have an easier time selling veganism to Afrikaners and Boers than, um, than <laughs> monarchy. Um, this is a, our culture is a culture of over 400 years of republicanism. So yeah, but anyway, um, it is interesting. The fact that I, I mentioned the, the post Trump world is that in the, in a way, I mean, you're, you live in Romania. I live in South Africa. We live on the very periphery of the, the big empires of the world. Um, we don't really live smack dab in the middle of one, but we are very much, uh, influenced by the big empires. That's one of the, so for the thumbnail of this, uh, of this episode, I used a bunch of words that kind of characterize, uh, some of the topics that, uh, we talk about in our circles and, uh, created like an image with it. But one of the words was empire. It's something that has come to the fore very much within this more dissident right or post-liberal is probably the better word, is the identification of empire and all the different factors and characteristics that come with it. It's almost like um, seeing, a, you used the metaphor earlier, of seeing something for the first time and then you can't unsee it. And I think when you start seeing just the world in regards to some of the big empire or imperial players within it, then uh, things start looking a bit differently. Um, uh, Afghanistan was a great example. I mean, wherever the, the BLM flag is waving, the American empire isn't far behind. They're just over the, the next hill. Um, and it's an interesting thing to observe, even here in South Africa, some of the telltale signs of which players are involved where. But Something that I did notice is that on within this new strand of uh, more conservable on the right side of the political spectrum politics, there's also a you mentioned going back to basics. I think that's the the right way to phrase it. But there's also a we have to rethink some of the the solutions that we thought were going to uh, going to save us. We thought that like like we said with the battle of ideas and debates and uh, these types of things are going to help us, but in the end practical on the ground stuff is going to save us i mean it's interesting because this whole conversation has started taking place in south africa as well completely 
uh, divorced from what's going on in the Western world. There's been many uh, recent debates now between people on the right side, or who I would call conservatives, but in a classical sense, and classical liberals, people that are genuinely... The, the, the best way to describe it is the divide between Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke, pretty much. But you see these types, I've, I've been in some of these debates. If you search uh, individualism versus communitarianism, you'll find one of those debates. And I've, I wrote one of those pieces, um, uh, a recent piece, um, Not Everyone is a Liberal, pretty much uh, uh, responding to one of these attacks against uh, conservatives in South Africa from classical liberals. But it's that focusing back on things like community, basic things, focusing on building family structures, focusing on building safety networks, thinking locally, not trying to save the world, saving your community, saving your street. It's these that going back to basics that I've definitely seen come to the fore. And it seems like that's somehow starting to click within uh, uh, the American uh, political spectrum, on the political spectrum, but also in, in Europe as well. We need to go back to some of the 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 solutions that we forgot we uh, for solutions for problems that we forgot existed, um, if I can put it that way. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think there's definitely a, a huge strain of, of, of localism, if you can describe it that way. Mm. There's also uh, a renewed emphasis on people, you know, participating in local politics, which essentially mm. tend to be the, the things that actually affect your life more than, than anything. Um, and I think it's also tied into, um, it's not neo-Ludditeism, it's just not mm techno optimism it's techno pessimism yeah. and i think a lot of people right. you know are trying to distance themselves a little bit from the machine mm. it's very hard mm. because it, the machine tends to integrate it tends to consolidate very fast uh, and you saw this you know by you know with covid as well um, you know the 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 destruction of of small business local business uh you know you've you your relationship with, with with amazon and all the couriers that come to your door and all this type of stuff so it's uh you know it's been a very bad time for for localism just structurally right. because of this situation um but i think a lot of people who think hard about this all like you said come to the same conclusion that there there needs to be um a focus on a different level of abstraction because if you're if you're you know a liberal subject, you are obviously you know the the individual, um, and the individual interacts with the market and it interacts with the state. It has certain interests. It needs you know have has certain needs met, uh, mm. has preferences and all this type of stuff. And you know that's uh, that's the only way to be essentially as a liberal subject. You you are born alone and naked. You die alone, and <laughs> that that's it. And hopefully you had fun on, along mm. the way. Uh, and that's kind of what the, the what the regime promises. The truth is that um, though humans exist on this level of abstraction. We also exist in others, obviously, as part of families, as part of communities, as part mm. of nations, as part of an ethnos, uh, part of a, a culture, things that uh, define us on a different level, which essentially just liberalism cannot account for. It does not deal on that level. And because it does not deal on that level and is extremely hegemonic, mm. it, it, you know, it, it sees no competitors. It does not want any competitors, cannot abide any competitors. Uh, it, it kind of tends to dissolve everything outside of that. So I think by becoming more local, by people focusing on that, they're essentially becoming a bit more illiberal. They're, they're choosing the unchosen bonds again. They're tying themselves to their families. They're tying themselves to their communities. The problem with this is that it is very hard. It is very hard. It's very hard to swim counter current mm -hmm. because everything, everything in the liberal system pulls you into the op opposite direction. Uh, and it's very comfortable, obviously, to... You know, it's uh, like I said before in a different podcast, it's a, it's a revealed preference uh, to yeah. not, you know, chat with your neighbors if you can, you know, whatever, mm. just uh, get your mail and whatever. Uh, it's a real preference to send your parents to um, to a nursing home instead of, you know, dealing with the with the with the terrible reality of death and decay yourself. Um, you know, sending your children off to daycare while you go to go work. Obviously, that's a re very much a revealed preference of many, many people in the world. Yeah. It's not, you know, I'm not necessarily judging, but it's, you know, there's a lot of um, individualism is a revealed preference of humans. The problem is that, you know, if you choose to be an individual too much, then it's it's essentially counter to your nature and then you get other problems. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's one of those situations where you, you kind of have to balance all of these levels of abstraction, even in your own person. Um, and, you know, liberalism can't do that. And a lot of, you know, the atomization, the, the, the you know, mental problems that we see, uh, depression, anxiety, all this stuff, I think is tied into this fact that 
we are living in a system that is optimized for one facet of what it means to be human, but completely has ignored or uh, suppressed every other aspect. Um, and that's extremely bad, even for mm. the individual. Mm. No, absolutely. And I think that's a, a lesson that uh, we are learning here in South Africa, but a lesson that's being learned in the West as well. And that is that convenience is uh, the root of many evils. Um, and this is something that uh, the modern world has lulled you into is that, well, just uh, outsource this responsibility to this company and outsource this responsibility to this state organ or to this piece of bureaucracy. And a lot of people do it and I don't blame them. It really makes your life easier. It makes your life yeah. more streamlined and you can listen to more podcasts. I mean, that's going to change the world. So you now you have more time to listen to uh, more uh, lectures online. But the thing about uh, convenience is that, and uh, outsourcing these responsibilities, is that when you need to take up some of these responsibilities again, uh, you're either not going to remember how or know how to do it because you grew up in a, in a world where you didn't have to know. Or the people that you have outsourced or the companies and corporations that you've outsourced these responsibilities to uh, now have your, uh, your, your hand or your fingers in a vice where you don't have a choice. You have to do what they say or else uh, you're going to be uh, left out in the cold. And unfortunately, that's that's slavery when it comes to being a slave to convenience, um, just outsourcing everything of, of that nature. South Africa is a good example where people uh, the, in, the pre, in the previous regime under apartheid, Afrikaners outsourced a lot of our responsibilities to the state. We outsourced our cultural preservation to the state. We outsourced uh, many uh, uh, job creation to the state. We uh, outsourced uh, a lot of things that we could have been doing ourselves, a lot of security aspects to the state. And now today, under the new South Africa regime, under the ANC, the ANC is still in charge of all those things and they're not delivering on it. So now Afrikaners have been forced to relearn doing or taking responsibility for many things that they outsourced for a long time. And um, actually, Flip Bass, um, the, uh, the head of the solidarity movement, always says something very controversial. He says the, the best thing that ever could have happened to Afrikaners was the end of apartheid, because then we actually now we actually are taking responsibility for the things that we should have been responsible for for very long. Um, things like preserving our language, preserving our culture, preserving our monuments, um, things that we should be doing ourselves as a community, not things that the state should be doing. Because the thing is, when another party takes control of that state apparatus that and a party that is antagonistic towards your culture, they're not going to preserve those things that you have outsourced to the state. But And you had a, a, a very excellent conversation with um, uh, Marta Maid. Um, I highly recommend it uh, to all my listeners when they're done listening to this one. Um, but he mentioned something in that chat that I think is very important. He talked about uh, rebuilding communities. And uh, our ancestors had a lot of things that we don't. They had all this infrastructure or communal infrastructure in regards to people uh, having many more social bonds, all these different clubs, all these different social arrangements that a lot of people in modernity and in modern times don't have anymore. And uh, rebuilding, that's going to be difficult, as he said in that podcast. But I think that's what you're going to have to start to have to start doing. You're going to have to start getting to work, rebuilding a lot of the things that you took for granted and therefore uh, you lost them over time. And I think that's probably our generation and the next one's big challenge is rebuilding some of the things that our ancestors built over many years in the past. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's going to come from from two directions, essentially. It's, one is going to be ideological. You know, people who, like us, have seen the, seen the other side, have been through the system and know what, what goes on, you know, have experienced um, the fact that, you know, even if the if the state uh, jumps in to, to save you, even if you can buy stuff in the market, it's not the same as having a relationship with someone who um, has essentially, you can't even describe it as an obligation, but it's just like, a family tie, you know, these unchosen bonds, they're just a very different mm. type of, of, of relationship with someone who, you know, for example, if you if you come on on hard times, um, you know, in Romania, still, we kind of have these familiar relations, you know, someone in your family mm. will come and, and, you know, help you, you can stay with them. Um, you have this increasingly or, or less in, in the West now. Um, and on the on the other hand, um, you know, these things are hard to rebuild once, like you said, they, they've decayed. You don't know how to rebuild them anymore. People around mm. you maybe don't want to rebuild them anymore because they don't mm. see the need for it, you know? Like you don't necessarily need to need a grandma if you can pay for a nanny. But what yes. if 
soon enough, you can't pay for a nanny. What if soon enough, you know, there's, there's no way that you can sustain your lifestyle anymore? Because um, it seems that we might be coming up on hard times in terms of actually, right. you know, not being able to um, uh, fill these gaps in our lives with con consumption. You know, maybe the state also might not be able to step in to save you from from, you know, life situations. They're not going to be able to put you in a, in a state sponsored nursing home. They're not going to give you a pension mm -hmm. because, you know, the currencies are eroding. So so. I'm sorry if I say this, shit, shit will hit the fan. Uh, and right. uh, I think a lot of people are might turn back towards family and community also mm -hmm. because of a need. Because, you know, the, the, not needing these things has been the, the biggest dissolver of these bonds very fast. Um, and needing them is probably going to be the, the strongest, <laughs> you know, strongest uh, impulse to actually rebuild them and, and you know, torn, uh, turn our attention back to these communities and rebuild them. Uh, it's, it's sad in a way that you just, you know, can't, um, you know, out of, out of own initiative, just jump in and, and, you know, just rebuild communities. But I think a lot of people just need that nudge, you know, to, to actually need to, to see your uncle sometimes <laughs> because mm. it might be nice to, to help each other out. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there is a nobleness in build, in that grand building of something, something that you might not even see the completion of. There's that example of the, the great cathedrals in Europe being built by people that knew that they're not going to see that cathedral uh, being uh, finished. They, that cathedral is going to take 500, 300 years, some of them, to finish. And But they still did it because they were building it for, for a future generation. It's that that Greek proverb of uh, planting a tree that you know you're never going to sit under is the sign of being of, of civilization. And that's what people are going to have to start doing. They're going to have to start planting trees that they're not going to know that they know they're not going to sit under. But that's what our forefathers did. So to now think that uh, I, I don't want to do that in the present time because I want to see the fruits of my labor. Uh, maybe you need to take a larger perspective. But that's why I like the fact that there's a there's a distinct vein of wholesomeness that also goes through this new version of the right or this new paradigm on the right there's definitely a start a vegetable garden or start a book club like a physical book club or talk to your neighbor all these wholesome stuff or start a family um these types of things they're very simple but they do have a a very big effect and there's a very strong anti-black pulling also going on which i welcome definitely i do actually a funny story when you when i mentioned black pilling there was once a guy in one of my tweets replies that perfectly summed up why taking the black pill is a horrible idea but it wasn't some prominent account it was just like a small 10 follower default avatar account and the other day i was thinking about his reply and i actually wanted to go look it up again to see what he actually said because i just remember thinking this is a perfect summation and I remember, so I, I couldn't remember what he said, but I remember I uh, responded to it by saying, like, this is a perfect summation. So I just looked up my tweet and then I found it. I'm like, OK, great. Now, if I just click expand, I can see what this guy said and I can refresh my memory. And I expand the conversation and it just says account suspended. And I'm like, yeah, well, so it goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I never figured out. But I remember it was something along the lines of um black pills as a an actual pill if you were drink if you drink it would have been a depressant and a pacifier um you said it more eloquent uh, elo summed it up better but that's the gist of what he said and i, I think that's true and that's why i'm glad there's this anti-black pill more positive optimistic but realistically optimistic wholesomeness to uh, the new paradigm on the right i don't know if you've noticed that as well Yes, absolutely. There are, there are different projects, you know, part of part of kind of the, the philosophical end is one thing, uh, but there's also um, the kind of the active end of it, you know, the, the doomer optimism, uh, the, uh, the homesteaders, uh, the, the vegetable garden people, uh, a lot of people having children, which I think is very nice. I think it's the ultimate, uh, the ultimate act of, of optimism. Um, absolutely. And I think, you know, there, there are a lot of black pills in life. I think, you know, life structurally has embedded black pills, you know, when no one's getting out alive. First black <laughs> pill, terrible, absolutely horrible. But at the same time, you know, there's there's wonderful aspects to life. So, yeah, I think um, I think people should maintain their optimism and like you you know you're you're in the middle of a very historical you know you're uh, you're literally an oppressed minority um and uh yeah it's 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 not easy but there is you know there's kind of this um 
yeah, this this grandiose aspect to it. And I feel like that's going to also bring out um, kind of this transcendent view in people, because like you said, mm -hmm. um, it's 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 very hard to plant trees at the you know at the shade the shade that you're not going to enjoy if if you do not have a certain transcendent view and that transcendent mm -hmm. view is also given by these historical situations where right. you have to fight for something bigger than your immediate pleasure which is a pretty a pretty foreign sentiment for a lot of people uh, who maybe immediate pleasure might be you know a, a bit hyperbolic but it's just like okay what's in it for me uh, am I getting money? How am I going to get paid? Uh, you know, what what type of apartment can I afford? You know, obviously normal mundane concerns, but there has mm. to be something more. Um, and the fact that you know, like I said, stuff might uh, might get uh, tougher soon um, mm. might be might contribute to a more transcendent view. And you can see this: a lot of people are drifting towards religion. Um, a lot of people going back to more serious religions, like, you know, Romanian Orthodox apparently is a, is a trending religion. Um, so, you know, people want um, a, a, a more rooted sense, uh, a more transcendent sense of themselves. And yeah, I think, you know, though I don't necessarily share it at that level, but, you know, it's uh, it's something that I um, I think is important. And uh, yeah, more mm. people are, are, are trying to, yeah, trying that uh, that feeling on of being part of something bigger. Mm. But I mean, I think uh, uh, the best example of uh, what you're describing there is the, the act of starting a family, because then inherently you're becoming part of something bigger than yourself. You are becoming, not only are you extending yourself, but you are also being enriched. Uh, you you deepen in regards to your the experience. I really do think uh, that's a, a very necessary part of the human experience is having that connection, having other people that are dependent on you, but then also being dependent on those people in that web of connections. Um, it's something that we've lost to a very large degree. And you see it, unfortunately, it's something that really breaks my heart, but it's the the loneliness of the chronically online. Now, unfortunately, that is a lot of people that are very smart, but some of them uh, a little bit obsessive about some of these things, but it's they're not bad people. They're not drug addicts. They're not. Uh, they don't have anything wrong with them. They're just living in a time where everything is pushing them towards being chronically online, and every uh, thing, everything in the past that pushed their ancestors to form social bonds is being disincentivized around them. So it, it's really a difficult time, I think, for young people to just create meaningful bonds. I mean, just things as simple as making friends. Now, I'm not someone that bashes online friends at all. I think if you meet people online that you don't meet in real life, but even though you don't get to meet them, you still get a connection there. You can talk about personal things. You can talk about things that you find enriching. I think that's also something that helps a lot of people in this difficult time. But at the same time, I have to add that I, there is nothing comparable to a real life physical friendship where you can talk face to face with someone uh, about things that matter or things that uh, you care about deeply. I think that's also very healthy. Um, I actually had a conversation on my channel uh, uh, just a few weeks back with a clinical psychologist about many of these things that it's being chronically online, if you can help it, is definitely something that you need to uh, avoid. Uh, you should get out there. You should touch grass to really use a, that cliche. But it is, I do also have to uh, um, admit that it is a difficult time and I have to concede that many young young people are driven towards uh, this more lonely uh, lifestyle by their surroundings. And it's something that uh, we're going to have to start doing something about, even in our own small personal capacities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the, the problem that I see, I've seen it in myself as well, is this, this fracturing of the information infrastructure. Mm -hmm. As you can imagine, there are not many people on the dissident right in my neighborhood here in Hicksville, right. Romania. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a, it's, we're not going to mm -hmm. be talking about this stuff. Um, yeah. So if I want to be talking about this stuff, I'll talk to, you know, you and different people online. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's obviously that I kind of get my fix of these ideas online. Um, I have a different discussions with my husband, who's part of kind of a fairly different information bubble, also partly online, but he's, he's got his own thing. Um, and I think maybe in, in your case, because you are in a, in a quite a, a very um, 
not necessarily unique, but but different <laughs> uh, situation. Uh, mm. You also part of, you know, like I said, a minority. Um, there's also turmoil going on, and you've got you've got stuff to talk about <laughs> with people close <laughs> to you. <laughs> so there yeah, might be you talk problem. about your uh, you talk about the massive pothole that you saw someone uh, entire car disappear into the other day. Yeah, that's pretty. That's that's pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, but the the thing is, like, um, mm. like I bring up this this anecdote a lot, and not to you know rag on my girlfriends and everything, but a lot of them mm. essentially are getting information off of Instagram. They're getting, you know, they're they're being um, essentially um, proselytized by material from the Empire right. Central, uh, and mm. they're talking to me about I don't know abortion rights in Alabama and transgender teenagers and all sorts of stuff that I'm like. I don't even want to start with you. Let's change the subject. <laughs> so it's it's crazy because you'd think, oh, you know, I'm moving back to, you know, my little small town and, you know, mm. at the end and of the world. And then the empire seems to find you. I mean, that's the, uh, I can relate yes. to that theme as an Afrikaner because, I mean, that's the story of the Fuertrekkers where they left the Cape Colony because the, the British came in and said, well, you're going to uh, anglicize and you're going, all your children are going to go to English schools. And you're going to live under the empire. And the Boers said, uh, no, screw that. We're just going to go this way. And they pointed to like the unknown. They don't know what's there. They just say, we're going to go this direction, the opposite direction of where you are. And they go into, uh, into the interior of South Africa. Uh, the British don't follow them until they find gold. And then the lesson of that story is the empire will always find you. Yeah, <laughs> it does, especially with the internet. The internet is a special yeah. little trick of the empire's sleeve nowadays and it's also because these are very like high status memes um you know if you speak english you're already kind of high status um if you you speak english well enough to to process all of this information you're even more high status um right. and it's uh yeah i mean i understand why uh it's also built into celebrity culture as well like you know these mm. these people look up to i don't know whatever kim kardashian and you know right. if, if she says something about black lives matter then they're like okay mm. yeah the party line assimilated yeah we know we're right. no black lives matter <laughs> right. so, yeah it's yeah. uh it's a bit depressing but it, it is what it is um Hmm. But that's why I'm glad that there is a foe. It, the problem is being acknowledged uh, specifically in a more conservative or right side of the spectrum circle, specifically in a more dissident right spectrum side of the spectrum conversations is that this is a problem. It's not ideal to constantly be tweeting, to constantly be shit posting, to constantly be posting. Uh, you need to do something outside, go for a hike, go just touch grass, literally, or do something in fresh air, get some vitamin D from the sun. It's it's It sounds very intuitive. It sounds very simple and, and obvious, but a lot of people don't know it. That's why in a previous episode, uh, I talked to that uh, friend of mine, the clinical psychologist, about specifically rediscovering solutions to problems that we forgot existed. So for example, um, going outside and getting that vitamin D kept our ancestors a lot healthier than uh, in many cases than we are today. But now suddenly we have to rediscover that, yeah, getting some sunlight every day is actually a very good thing. But that's something that uh, people took for granted. But it is encouraging seeing that uh, that more wholesome, uh, real life orientated uh, angle getting back into the conversation. I think that's very important. Yeah. Now, it's, um, oh yeah. I just wanted it. to say that you know I think mm. people are starting to get a bit tired of politics. Like I said, you know, there's mm. a, a bit of a hamster wheel aspect to it. <laughs> people are running on empty. Um, the the real mm. interesting parts are essentially you know studying philosophy, which is a bit of a kind of a, a slow moving obsession mm. in itself. It's not you're not going to go you know uh, talk about that in an actual political situation. So I think at least for a big part of the dissident right, they've kind of chilled out in many ways. Um, mm. Yeah, and yeah, people should get back to reading. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and people do. Mm. Um, and they read. And like you said, you know, they, they're starting to just retract because it's, it, it's boring at this point. It really isn't, mm. isn't you know, it, it's not uh, 2016. Right. And at some point you have to realize uh, the endless battle over who controls the state leviathan in your little in your western democracy insert name here is uh, is not worth it. it that's not the solution the solution is to build so is to build the the type of communities and infrastructure and networks that your ancestors had built over a long time but you need to start rebuilding that on a small scale that's why i like that uh, you touched on that theme with uh, martin made on your on your podcast so 
Something else that I've also noticed that I think is important when it comes to the, the dissident right circles is the fact that uh, there doesn't seem to be any uh, mincing of words or any misconceptions when it comes to uh, what you touched on earlier, and that's the, the disillusionment with many uh, liberal ideas and many ideas of the, the battle of ideas, the best ideas will win. But if you now think about some of the conversations you've had, the very practical, practically orientated conversations on your podcast, what are some of the solutions that you genuinely, when you heard them explain to you on your podcast, you thought, no, this is something that actually feels like it could work. This isn't just the next version of uh, if we podcast harder, the world will be a better place. Are there any of these types of solutions that really stood out to you where you thought, this is something fresh and I think this is maybe um, there's some substance here, something real and concrete? Yeah, that's essentially one of the um, the criticisms that I get. I guess the whole the whole dissident right gets because there is uh, there's not that many solutions. Mm. Obviously, localism is one solution, but right. the the obvious retort to that would be that um, because liberalism is is a very you know, like I said hegemonic, powerful system, it does not accept competition, so it will find a way to to snuff you out. Um, on the other hand, you know, like we see a lot of the the main narratives of liberalism are crumbling. Um, Essentially, there's a lot of um, contradictions in the system, so it is destabilizing quite quite fast. Um, I mean, one one option obviously is nationalism, um, and at the moment, you know, because we're such a um, a colorful uh, situation mm -hmm. globally, we're probably going to be a, more of a kind of a civic nationalism, but with you know, kind of um, the uh, understanding that each nation has an ethnos, and that ethnos comes first. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what what I see as probably a more doable solution. Um, in terms of you know this the substructure that we already have and what what we want to do so you kind of have want to have these nations that still do trade amongst each other but where um, the conception of the, the the national core is tied to the ethnos to the culture to the language and and protecting mm -hmm. and seeing these as a source of renewal a source of yeah essentially the the identity of the country is comes first um, mm -hmm. so I think that's probably the most doable thing that, um, you know, I don't think anyone particularly has made this case, but that's kind of my conclusion that I've come mm, just listening mm. to all these people and, and thinking about that. Um, there's, um, I mean, localism obviously is a good thing. Um, very, very good solutions. You know, like I said, a lot of people go back to philosophy um, right. and a lot of people um, think about this from a very structural level. You know, it's, uh, mm. it's about, um, technology. It's about, uh, you know, because for example, I always give this example, like, you know, feminism, a lot of people think, oh, you know, feminism came in and, you know, all the, you know, the pill, feminism invented <laughs> the pill and feminism yeah. just, you know, destroyed the relations between the sexes. Mm. Feminism is kind of an explanatory framework for what the market already did. For, yeah. for what technology already did for what, you know, the world wars what already convenience did. already did. Yeah. Exactly. For what, you know, the situation already was. And then there were people, you know, women who were theoreticians around this and they explained it. You know, a lot of postmodernism is this as well. You know, a lot of like, people like Baudrillard look at, uh, looked at what was actually happening in technology. They were looking at, you know, essentially simulations and, and things that are already going on and being theoreticians and, and explaining creating explanations around what already was going on. They were not proposing anything necessarily. They were just saying, okay, this right. is the future given what's going on right now. Uh, and I think a lot of feminists were like, okay, this is the future given, given what's going on right now. Um, so I think, um, I think that's, that's an interesting angle that a lot of my guests take as well. Like they, they look at, you know, what's going on right now and they're theoreticians about it, but it's very hard to say, um, it's very hard to be like, okay, this is the next regime and we just need to implement mm. it. Um, there has to be, whatever's coming next will have to be uh, adapted to uh, the conditions that we're in already in terms of technology and all this stuff. Uh, if we don't want to go full Ted Kaczynski and just, you know, I don't know <laughs> nuke all technology and you mm. know, go back to <laughs> nature red in tooth and claw. But I don't think anyone wants to do that yet. Mm, yeah, and I see uh, uh, the dodgy idealist said something in chat that I actually want to address. He said, uh, uh, and he's in response to what I said, uh, fighting over the, the state Leviathan. He said, um, to ignore the federal government and its enactments is also dangerous. Without enough citizen support, parallel communities and economies tend to collapse. Now, 
what's interesting here is uh, I do agree that uh, you shouldn't throw away uh, all these politics concerning government and politics concerning the state. I think that's still a very important part of the conversation. And that's why uh, I still look at uh, elections, not as in a nihilistic way, but rather in a way of let's see what's going to happen here. This might be, have a positive effect. My point is you shouldn't uh, bet your all your chips, your entire destiny on a, an election or whether uh, your party wins in the future, because then you're going to maybe uh, bet it all and you're going to lose it all. So rather the Titanic, let's take South Africa, for example, because I think being a South African and growing up in South Africa under the ANC regime um, is kind of one of the influences for this view of mine. Um, I've, I'm not going to bet all my uh, cultural capital on the ANC losing power and some enlightened party gaining support and winning and then uh, South Africa is back on track. Um, no, the Titanic is heading for the iceberg. And um, the biggest mistake that the people on the Titanic made was accepting till the very last minute that this ship was going to survive. The people always use the metaphor of uh, uh, moving around deck chairs on the Titanic, but that's the wrong, wrong, wrong thing to focus on. What people need to focus on is everyone in the command center of that Titanic was still operating on the premise up until the last almost last few moments that the ship is going to survive the ship is going to survive rather than uh orderly starting to say well we need to start getting life rafts into the water we need to start building makeshift life rafts from furniture we need to start doing x and y and z and when you're living in that type of system that's definitely heading for the iceberg you'd better start making some life rafts that doesn't mean that uh Everything is now doomed and you need to be blackpilled about the, the country that you're living in or the government that, uh, of your country. Um, I do, like I said, I think elections are important. But at the same time, you also need to start doing little things. That maybe leads up to this question that I also want to pose to you, uh, uh, Alex. And I'll give a quick uh, intro there before, uh, before you can also answer. That's where this question comes in. How do we fix atomized society? Well, my suggestion would be, and because that's what I'm doing, is stop being an atom. Start attracting some atoms around you and start creating some things of substance. Start creating some little structures. Um, look at some of the other atomized uh, individuals around you and start pulling them closer and start creating some structures. Start doing that on a very small scale. And I think that's something that I'm very glad people on the more dissident right or people on the um, on the right side of the spectrum where we kind of operate uh, are realizing this, is that you can also make a small difference in your own capacity and uh, you better start doing that because the, the best day to start doing that was already yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's no really any way out of this, but through, you know, a, a, a lot of people think that if we find the perfect philosophy, in a way, it's kind of like mm. the, the, the the battle of ideas saying, you know, just, right. just sit down and just devise the perfect regime and then go out and, and present it. You know, write a write a white paper about the perfect regime, and then everyone knows about it, and then you uh, you just uh, you fix you fix society with that. Um, unfortunately, what we've lost, we've lost slowly um, and comfortably. You know, comfortably numb. We've become. Uh, it's going to have to involve a jolt um, of discomfort, uh, and it will have to be done at the level of each in individual. You know, de-individualizing themselves, uh, sacrificing yeah. some of that individuality on the altar. Of something greater um will people mm. believe in something greater that's that's a question i think that's where a, a narrative comes in and that's where mm. i think the dissident right can contribute um will this narrative mm. be religious in the stricter sense will it be i don't know integralism mm. catholicism i don't know some new protestant reformation back to more mm. religiousness <laughs> who knows it could be all sorts of um yeah. all sorts of directions but um it will have to be ex narratively extremely powerful to jolt people into that. But like I said, there's also the fact that life will probably become harder. You know, it's just like, I see this mm. every day, like the the price of, I, I buy some like baby food for, for my baby. Right. It jumped 40% overnight, just from, from yesterday to today. Mm. Uh, shortages, the, the brand of diapers that I've been using, literally none left. I have to change brands because there are none left. So mm. there's a lot of stuff happening. It's not on the news. It's just literally in the supply chain. And I can yeah. see it, I can feel it. This stuff didn't used to happen. It's happening mm. now, and uh, I think the, probably the best way to deal with it is to turn around and start, you know, strategizing with the people around you and, and do something. Mm. Yeah, a good example of that was during the, the massive unrest here in South Africa last year. I think you probably saw that on social media where there was like 
incredible massive unrest the largest since 1994 in many of the major cities here in south africa and many of the communities stood together and defended their communities people that have never talked to each other got together and started blockading their streets to make sure that people the the, the rioters can't get in there and people started make protecting businesses the the uh, wheelchair sniper was one of the <laughs> one of the means that came out of that a guy protecting a shop uh move over uh korean snipers on the roof you've got a, a wheelchair sniper here defending his little fish and chip shop so uh, that's what you see when times get hard and i mean it's absolutely true what you're saying there alex things are going to get difficult but then at the same time as i said on your podcast um when things get difficult uh, you're also going to see some true people of character come to the fore real leaders and people that are pillars in the community be formed in that time um and that's a that's a more uh moral uh, something that boosts morale that you're going to see and at the same time also uh i think inflation is there now that you mention it is definitely going to be one of the defining issues of of 2022 uh because the thing is many many issues can easily be spinned or can be hidden uh, through some very clever propaganda but inflation is not something you can hide you can't tell people to not believe their lying wallets um so we're going to i think see a lot of rhetoric and a lot of politics surrounding that uh, in the near future and you can see the powers that be already scrambling to get the the hold of the narrative what is it is inflation pro poor is inflation only bad for the rich is inflation happening is it not happening is it happening but it's not that bad it's happening but it's actually good you can see them pretty much scrambling to figure that out but that's a sign that it's going to be i think one of the big uh, issues of of the year and i think that's definitely some way to keep an eye on uh, not just in in your own country but uh, in the broader picture yeah, and I think a, a lot of people should start thinking about diversifying. I know, obviously, this is a, the, the next step, but um, crypto is a big thing. Crypto is also quite an, like, an ethereal thing. Um, I have money in crypto, obviously, but also I think people should think about, you know, commodities, you know, like go go back to, you know, think think broadly, you know, gold, silver, of just cured like cured meats uh, yeah cured <laughs> meats you know stock up your pantry um yeah, you know, get the get very good at pickling all these types of vegetables and stuff exactly. that you grow yourself <laughs> exactly root cellars you know the, the works um yeah prep be mm. prepper mindset that's what you need um <laughs> yeah it's it's you really it's i think that's one one thing you know i if you'd ask me like i don't know seven or eight years ago when i was in like my debunking mindset i was the most mm. credulous person everything was a conspiracy theory if it didn't come from everything the, needed like, to be debunked exactly i was debunking hard <laughs> everything it's like oh this no conspiracy mm. conspiracy mm. uh you know because i was trusting i was trusting the science i was trusting mm. you know the authorities like you know obviously people in brussels know much more than than my lying yeah. eyes so um yeah. and now it's almost the opposite and in a way i'm 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 bunked myself a bit too hard because it is very hard i really mm. mistrust the authority so hard now because mm. i've seen um you know have that like gelman amnesia I, I know my domain so well that i've seen them lie through their teeth in my domain so many times that i know that every mm. other domain that they report on is really really badly uh really really badly you know con constructed so yeah um i i definitely advise people to um yeah invest in, in in that in the future <laughs> mm. so uh, one of the as we start wrapping up here i also wanted to ask you uh, i started off the the conversation with um the type of guests that you have uh, pretty much you have a very i think a very strong character to your podcast it's not just like you throw a dart at a dartboard there is some coherence in regards to the types of personalities and thinkers that you have on your podcast from at least from what i can see um but maybe just to explain to us uh, that process how do you identify people to talk to is it actually a dartboard that you just throw and there's like pictures of anon accounts on it or is there a <laughs> little bit of a, a maybe a measure that you use or a type of a, a test that you that you use to identify people that you think that this is someone that I would like to talk to. Yeah, I um, 
it's it's generally the direction that I'm interested in. I mean, intellectually, philosophically, it's just hmm. this whole sphere of post liberalism. That's probably the main overarching theme that I uh, that I'm interested in. But within that sphere, you have people I don't know, like Sora Bamari, or people who are more mainstream, like post liberals, and then you have people like Zero HP Lovecraft, who are more hmm. less. I mean, less mainstream. I guess you wouldn't really put him on on TV. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, there's. Yeah, quite he's a- not going to be on Fox News anytime soon. You know, maybe not officially. They won't post yeah. the tweets, but they'll they'll cite them. I'm sure there, there's right. been all sorts of uh, anons on there, um, and uh, I think probably I'm. I think their stuff is really interesting. They don't actively hate me personally, though. I've had like all sorts of misogynists on, and also people who like maybe hate me in more um, metaphorical ways, <laughs> but not mm. not directly. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the only. You know, they don't think I'm a fed. I think that's pretty much the standard mm, that important. I apply to anonymous <laughs> accounts. Um, and yeah, and people that I think are really interesting. I, there's some people that I'm trying to get on the podcast, but they haven't responded mm. to my incessant emails. I really like to have Peter Hitchens on. I'd really like mm. to have Theodore da- Dalrymple on. He's, he's really great as well. Uh, John Gray, the philosopher, I also love mm. to have on. But um, no such luck. So if anyone knows these people, <laughs> ping them. <laughs> Stress <Yeah>. them. <laughs> Bully them. <laughs> it's gonna be nice <laughs> mm. no well i can definitely say that I, I highly recommend people check out your podcast and uh yeah i think it's it's an interesting development i've i've like i've pretty much affirmed throughout this this conversation is that i'm i'm very heartened by what i'm seeing uh within our circles and uh within uh the broader picture of uh, the right side of the spectrum i see people going back to well I don't think we, it's pretty much this attitude of, I don't think we have uh, any, the luxury of just discussing ideas anymore. I think we're going to have to start doing something, building institutions, even if it's just like proto institutions, uh, building community networks, uh, taking the carrot pull and planting a bunch of beets and carrots in your backyard. Um, I mean, I started a vegetable garden this year. And the the fact is one night, uh, one of my guests, we had to postpone the conversation, the episode. And I I realized I didn't have a I didn't have a guest to talk to, so I just did a solo episode that I do uh, ever so often. And then I just talked about my vegetable garden and talked about creating things and how, how fulfilling it is to do work with uh, uh, with your hands and to do something uh, in the real world to create things. I mean, I created this little like uh, frame for my tomatoes to grow on out of scrap wood and felt very i felt very accomplished it felt very nice afterwards uh because now it's uh, it's practical and it's uh doing its job and i needed it and that episode i thought it was going to be just this it's probably going to get very little views because i'm not talking to some blockbuster intellectual on there i'm just talking about like my experience building things planting things creating things and it was in my top 10 most watched episodes of last year so it was the sleeper hit but it, it also opened my eyes to that fact that this is the type of thing that people are getting into. This is something that people really want to have a hear more conversations on is this type of content of where can I start improving my surroundings? Where can I start creating something that are, in the end, when it's done, I'm going to feel fulfilled. I'm going to feel like I did something that uh, I could pat myself on the back for. Yeah, there's there's a definite hunger for that uh, because, like you said, it's it's a visceral experience. You know, when you do something with your hands, when you grow a garden, when you see those little changes every day, um, when you have right. a child, obviously that's a everything happens very fast, and it's a, it's it's all of these experiences uh, at the same time. Um, it's just it kind of shocks you out of your um, numbness. You know, the atomi- atom- atomization leaves your body instantly when you do these things because you're connected to something else and even if you don't believe in anything transcendent you know the, just these acts tend to um yeah to, to shock you out of your complacency because yeah mm. they're undeniable so mm. yeah yeah do no, more, do more of these things guys <laughs> Mm. No, it sounds simple, but it, it really makes a big difference. Uh, before we get to final thoughts, I just firstly want to thank Hatskop Software for the 70 Rand Super Chat. Thank you very much. Again, this is, uh, if you guys are unaware, this is the guy creating on his own a Boer War game. 
Uh, go check out Hotscorp Software on Twitter. Uh, this guy is doing some amazing work, and I really look forward to seeing the finished product of his game. It's already looking very interesting. So go check it out, and thank you again for the for the super chat. And then before we get to final thoughts, uh, I just want to uh, also thank our sponsor. Now the the thing is. Uh, the joke on this channel was always that I'm uh, the African Diogenes because I don't really encourage people to do super chats. Super chats are there if you want to, I, but I'm reading everyone's comments. Um, it's not like I encourage people, like if you want to appear on the screen, send a, a super chat. It's just there if you really want to uh, give me a little bit of a tip that I can use to to improve the show. But also the same goes for for sponsors, like the, the sponsor here tonight has been a sponsor for a long while, but it's not like I seek them out. It's more of like this is a company that one of my friends started um and uh he wanted to to advertise here and i was like yeah sure you he's been a guest on this podcast so it's not like it's uh i'm shilling something that i'm uh, that i don't even think is a good product um so everyone uh, i think a lot of my listeners already know about bidvice uh, but this is if you are unaware if you want to get into crypto and you're south african um and it's something that you uh, are still a bit unsure about uh bidvice can help you out so uh, Bitvice is the only place in South Africa that sells Bitcoin directly to your self-custody, uh, meaning that unlike a traditional crypto exchange, you don't have to uh, trust anyone to hold your Bitcoin for you. Uh, this also removes uh, the majority of the risk associated with Bitcoin, uh, the largest risk. And then also uh, go check out their podcast called By the Horns, where they discuss all the latest uh, news and developments in the world of crypto and specifically Bitcoin. And like I said, uh, I know the, the people behind this, so it's not like it's some type of scam. Um, but you can go check it out. Um, and uh, if you have any questions surrounding it, you can always contact them and they will get back to you very quickly. So uh, go check out uh, Bidvice. There's a link in the description. And thank you very much for uh, for sponsoring this episode again. So Alex, we've come to the, the end of the show. Um, before I give you the opportunity to show all your content, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you pretty much uh, have all, you pretty much have a link tree, but uh, you can, uh, I'll, I'll give you that opportunity as well. But uh, lastly, just, some final thoughts if you want to leave the audience tonight with something maybe just to chew on not something too heavy just something to leave at the back of their mind uh for the the week ahead something to when they're just uh, standing in the shower and they want to do some philosophizing they can remember well uh i had this uh, little thing that i've been saving that i want to <laughs> contemplate a little bit what would you leave them with yeah to um to realize that you know the, the only way out is through is through for for our generation and then the people in the sphere um to not you know be stressed out by the black pills they'll encounter in the middle because they are unavoidable you know a lot of people that's that's kind of how you get get through the through the darkness is to bump against these black pills um overall the overall picture is is bright um it might you know we're living in in historically problematic interesting times like they say um but you know i always compare it to to my grandparents generation you know the the red army mm. it is not <laughs> so it's uh it's you know we we have the challenges that we have uh yours might be more immediate ours might be more you know philosophical at this point mm. uh, but they are challenges so that we can uh, conquer them. Uh, and I wish that everyone finds uh, a small way to, to conquer them in, in the next week uh, on a personal level, because that's that's mm -hmm. where we have agency. That's where we can act. So, yeah, gardening, pickling, cooking <laughs> for your family, having children. Have children yeah. this week, people. <laughs> so, <laughs> Do it this week now. Put, this week. put aside everything that you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that's that's mm. my my final thought <laughs> mm. no thank you very much i think that's a that's an excellent one now before we say goodbye i just want to uh give some uh tlc to some of the final comments here in the chat i see a uh, same seamus says cliche i know but i've grown potatoes in the city seamus i live in the city i've been growing spinach uh bell peppers tomatoes potatoes all kinds of herbs and many other things as well so go for it uh, you're doing the right thing you're doing uh you're doing what you're you uh, you've been made for working with your your hands in the soil dagbreker says great show great guest thank you very much bye donkey dagbreker that you ingeskakel het yes altyd hier so in die in die live chat sexy then i see also dodgy idealist uh, who's been listening to the whole co uh, conversation says shut it and take my money uh, love your content thank you very much dodgy idealist i really appreciate it for the three uh 35 rand super chat really appreciate it thank you very much um guardian prepping says uh thank you for the stream conscious caracol thank you very much for tuning in man 
Um, and then Jay Enns says, thanks, uh, guys. I missed the start, but we'll watch the rest ASAP. Well, I highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Sideliner Opinion says, sorry I'm late. Was visiting a friend. Well, that's what you should be doing. You shouldn't be prioritizing listening to a show uh, stream live over visiting a friend in real life. Do that. You can always listen to the stream afterwards. I would never encourage anyone to do anything else to, to put their life on hold for a stream don't do it and then yeah the super chats have now started coming in uh thank you very much guardian prepping says for a 35 rand super chat always a good time to prepare good show thank you very much really appreciate it dodgy idealist says biki biki mark buyer so pretty much saying little by little makes a lot uh, absolutely Gert Janssen van Rensburg gives a super chat for 70 rand who says so get uh trellis for your new veg to be planted a trellis what's a what's a trellis Gert? you're going to have to tell me in a in a next stream in the chat because we're close to the end now here um and then chris wyatt uh colonel chris riot uh has given a two dollar sticker thank you very much uh mr wyatt or colonel wyatt i really appreciate it okay last comment that i'm going to read before i say goodbye and that's from the freighter watcher who says thank you great conversation thank you for joining us today alex well, thank you very much for tuning in, Defray to Watch. I really appreciate it. So, guys, have a good one. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Enjoy the rest of your week. And then also stay safe this weekend. If you're new to this channel, leave a like. Uh, subscribe if you like this type of conversation. And also, uh, I'm going to take the liberty of shilling uh, Alex's content. All the links that is necessary are in the description to go check out her podcast. Highly recommend it. Also, her Twitter uh, everything that you need if you don't ha even have to type it into the the search bar you can just click the link it's down there you can go check it out after the stream so cheers guys have a good one thanks again for coming on alex and i hope you and everyone that tuned in has an excellent week and an excellent weekend cheers, cheers. guys thanks for having me on have a good one and god bless <laughs>